Hello and welcome back to the last session of Fierce Wireless's 5G Blitz Week. If you are joining us now, my name is Oliver Ward, your host. Allow me to start the session by thanking our sponsors. We've had a busy week exploring some key parts of the connectivity ecosystem, in addition to some key 5G achievements and predictions. For this last session, we're going to look at the role of standalone architecture and hyper automation in delivering efficient 5G. Here's what you can expect. Getting us started at 11 a.m. Eastern time, Sid uh, Chinomolo from Dish Wireless will open the session with his keynote. Then Rima Iontel from Red Hat will deliver the partner keynote. Then Viet Nguyen from 5G Americas will close the session with his panel discussion as he is joined by speakers from Rakuten Symphony, Mitre and Pakal Finet Consulting. As always, make sure you're submitting your questions in the Q&A tab at the top of your screen and be sure to, uh, to check out the part of the content hub for all content provided by our partners. So enough from me for now. Let's get started with our final session. Sid, the floor is all yours. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me, wherever you're connecting from. My name is Sid Chanamolu. I'm the Vice President of Technology Development at Dish Wireless. Today on the topic of delivering efficient 5G standalone architecture and hyper automation, I like to start thinking from the big picture. We'll take it from the top, we say, why do we need it? Then we can discuss about the role of 5G and then get into the automation piece. So obviously I won't get into the details of why 5G is so great because I think it has been discussed for many months now and everyone understands it. So I leave the technology part out and take it from the top. Now the connectivity. As a CSP, we are in the business of offering services through connectivity. And this landscape has significantly changed recently and quite quickly, in fact. About 50 years ago, uh, I think it was April 3rd, 1973, when the first voice call was made out of New York City. And 20 years later since then, the first text message was sent. Now, 25 years after that, we went into the communication era of a smartphone. A new era of app-driven connectivity came into picture with the smartphones, and more not much as a smartphone, but because of the app stores. Today, there's a higher communication or more data that is being pushed through the apps than the voice or the text messages today. But all of that is going to change with 5G. We are moving from a simple communication to ambient connectivity. As we think about going from a human to human, to human to machine, and machine to machine communication, the role of 5G and the, what it does to improve the productivity, safe, human safety, and even sustainability is going to be a game changer. 5G predominantly creates a different use cases that can be, that are significantly different than a smartphone base that we are used to today. So what does all this mean? At the minimum, the way we think about a network from a CSP perspective is different now. Today, if you look at a smartphone-based network, we are predominantly downlink heavy. Sometimes we have 8 is to 1 ratio or even 11 is to 1 ratio for data consumption. Most of it is on the downlink driven by video. But when we think about industrial application, it's equal. The downlink and uplink usage is near equal. But then it gets skewed to a different direction for something like a smart AI-based camera that is used for automation and security. It is predominantly uplink driven. So what we thought as a busy hour in a regular cellular network does not apply anywhere, anymore. The network design has to be fundamentally changed. Now, again, what does it mean? Right, you have to think about the drive for connectivity change is creating a telco transformation. And at the heart of that is the 5G. With 5G, it brings the new use cases to the forefront. But again, let me take a, take a step back and explain what is unique about 5G. The first is a service-based architecture. The ability to move messages with an API-driven framework and HTTPS-based communication is a game changer. This allows us to increase the velocity of integration with vertical markets very quickly. And the next part is the slicing. 5G slicing is a most capable and powerful tool set that 5G brings to the table. What does it do? It basically allows you to customize a network either from a RAN perspective or from the core perspective or even end-to-end -end including transport 
You can slice a network for security reason. You can slice a network based on features, slice a network based on resources, and the list goes on. It is the powerful attribute of the network that allows you to customize the network the way it is needed for each vertical application. Next is the hybrid cloud. And when I say hybrid cloud, I don't mean a simple virtualization of the network function. It is the way a network function is implemented in a cloud native manner, the way it can be used on any cloud. Fundamentally, the cloud enables us to move at a higher velocity of deployment. Think DevOps here. The next one is AIML. Very widely used term, but if we can leverage AIML to design, optimize, integrate, and manage a 5G network, wouldn't that be great? Now, one can say that, well, hybrid cloud and AIML are not part of 5G specifications, and that is true. But today, there is no discussion without both of them. They are tied to the hip. So a 5G network powered by hybrid cloud and AIML is the way to go. Now, all this is fine. So how does one think about architecture? Right? What are the unique attributes that one needs to have to enable all of this? The first is a partnership. I'm talking about shared responsibility. It is no longer about one person or one company trying to build everything and owning everything. The use cases are vast. It's all about sharing. Think SaaS model. This partnership is what going to allow for us to reach the new verticals with minimal cost. Next modular design, reusability of the network functions that we have, each attribute. Today, again, going back to the so many use cases that 5G enables, it makes no sense to build a monolithic for each use cases for a very short period of time. We have to think about partnerships and reuse what we have in a modular manner. Cloud first. By default, every vertical market today is in the cloud. So even the 5G network should also be in the cloud. And it again, it not only improves our velocity, but also allows us to scale faster on demand. The deep visibility. Once you build a network, it's no longer about simple SLA of a call drop or accessibility. This is how the packet is moving securely from one point to another in a reliable manner. That is why we need the deep observability at each layer of the network. APIs. Now, APIs and marketplace have been elusive to telcos for a very long time. They were predominantly used by hyperscalers, and they have done that very well there. Now, but if you look at the MWC that happened recently, all the discussions were about APIs, Kamara, Open Gateway, et cetera. And in fact, uh, TM Forum and 3GPP have done a tremendous job of promoting network APIs. So on the whole, these five attributes makes the next generation of 5G architecture. Now, how does one deliver the network? All this is fine. Well, there are a few ways to do it. First, we can deliver as a complete black box. It's a pre-integrated solution from a single vendor, a very simple way to deliver to get the job done. Next way is we can do some customization on how the network gets delivered. It can, the customization can be done either by a CSP, by the in-house team, or it can be done a third-party integrator. The last option is a completely disaggregated way to do it. And imagine your consumer also has a say in that one. But for this, you need a next level of orchestration mechanism to deliver it. It's more complex. The simplest way to explain this is, imagine you're trying to go buy a suit in the market. You can buy a suit off the shelf, which is the first way. Or you can have a tailor do some modifications to the suit that fits you. It's a second option. Or you can get a completely tailor-made suit that fits to your exact needs and dimensions, which is what you get with the disaggregated solution. Again, this is not you have to pick one size or one option. All three should be in the toolkit for an operator. Now, end-to-end -end automation. Again, automation is the way for us to deliver all the use cases, no doubt about that. But where does automation start? Right? Again, I don't want to go into details of uh, very specific automation tools that need to be used, because there are quite a many in the market, and all are good. I'll, I'd like to spend time on describing the areas where automation is needed from a CSP point of view, from top to bottom. But before I get into that, imagine that when you go through these points, imagine that you're not just building a smartphone network. You're building a network of networks. You have hundreds of networks with different verticals that you're trying to meet and offer service to them. 
So with that perspective, let's get into it. It starts with the planning. That's the first stage of our network planning, right? When you have a network that needs to build, it starts with the simple planning. Imagine we have automation that can help us with not only generate, but also iterate on the network designs. This will increase the velocity at which we can go to the market very quickly, instead of doing with a pen and paper. Now, once you have a network plan done, what does it mean? We can have automation do the configuration of the network to enable that particular service to meet the SLA, instead of doing it manually. It reduces the time and cost. So, we have a network design, we have a configuration, but we need to validate to ensure that the design meets the criteria. So we need a set of test cases, and the set test cases have to be customized for that particular intent, whether it's a conformance test case, performance, feature-specific test case, or any one of them. There has to be automation process for us to select and design a test case. This, again, is a cost-saving, cost saving, and moves at a very good velocity of network viability. Next. You got all this stuff done, but how do you test it? There has to be test automation, uh, test automation framework where you automatically inject these test cases and get the job done. Now, I'm not talking simple serial or parallel execution of test cases. Imagine integration of this framework with a ticketing system where you can automatically collect the log files, analyze the log files, get to the KPIs. If any issues happen, you can contact the supplier directly. That kind of automation should be there. So, okay, we have a design, we planned it very well, configuration in place, it meets all the criteria, time for deployment. There are a lot of CI CD pipelines out there, and definitely most CSPs are looking at CD pipelines for deploying in the cloud today. So we deploy in an automated manner, very well known, good. Now, the job is not done, because you deploy a network, but it still needs to integrate with the IT systems. It needs to be integrated with the ticketing system, customer care, and other processes. So there's an automation that is required for seamless integration of a network with other attributes of the company. From there onwards, okay, everything is nice, but how does one monitor it to make sure that it all works? Now comes a centralized management system. There is a place where you have an active configuration at all time and disaster recovery to ensure network is operating, and this has to be automated. Again, imagine you're not operating one network, you're operating hundreds of networks simultaneously. Next comes observability. Again, I keep repeating this one, but in this case, you're not just doing observability to ensure you're meeting the KPIs. You're proactively monitoring these hundreds of networks. So you need to have deep observability in the networks and analytics that can take action to recover and remedy a situation if it happens. The last one is the optimization. Again, this one is a continuous loop. It never stops. We basically go back to step number one and keep optimizing every, every step in the way and make it better, make it more cost efficient and everything. So it's an ongoing journey of the automation. Now, you someone will ask, well, we understand 5G, we understand the principles, we understand the need of automation, but why is it not happening? Why are we still lagging this one? So I want to spend a few minutes on talking about the enablers for hyper-automation. And the first is the mindset. Although we are deploying a telco network, it is being deployed from with IT principles. The network is not being deployed just for high availability, it's an outcome-driven network now. It has to be built for a purpose to meet an objective. That's a shift in the mindset. Second is the people. Now, as simplest example I would take is that we're in the business of delivering a telco over cloud. That means we need engineers or technologists who are not only capable in the domain of telco, but they need to understand cloud also. So we need to cross train the people in both the domains. It is not something CSPs have been good at, but something they need to improve on. And not only we have to cross train them, we have to retain the talent. Next is the process that follows the people. Every step, every decision that has to be taken should be data driven. It cannot be based on a gut factor or prior experience because none of that applies anymore in the new world of 5G. Simplest way, I think it has, it has been well said, your network is a reflection of your organization. If you want your network to be data driven, your organization decision process has to be data driven too. 
Next one, cloud networking. Uh, this is a little bit more technical. Uh, again, if I take a step back, every application where, and is trying to reach either a database or a control plane that is spread out into multiple clouds. As a CSP, our job is to move the packet reliably, securely, and efficiently from one cloud to another. We need to be very good at that. This is a new field, and we need to develop multi-cloud networking, which is lacking currently in the CSP world. That is absolutely required. Now, using of AI. Uh, taking a step back, we are not designing a single network anymore. We are trying to design multiple networks whose requirements are constantly changing. So instead of using pen and paper to do that, why don't we use AI to design engineering guidelines and principles? Imagine the, how we can leverage digital twin to do this and cut short our time and imagine different options that is possible. Similarly, on the same line, machine learning. The amount of data that is generated with the networks today is unimaginable. Right? We collect all kinds of stats at every layer of the network. None of the data is structured, and we cannot normalize it. It is a fact. So by simple, by that means is that as a human, you cannot understand the data that is flowing through it. So we have to leverage machine learning to understand the data, for them to detect the patterns, anomalies to tell us where and how an SLA can be impacted. So we have to use that. The last one is a network management. Again, can't stress it enough. It is not a network management of a single network. It's a network management of multiple slices, network management of multiple networks, multiple objectives, et cetera. So it's not a simple task. Once we, this is one of the key enablers for us to manage multiple networks simultaneously. I think uh, that brings me to the end. Uh, we covered a lot of topics today from the requirements of connectivity, the 5G, the enablers, where automation fits in and, and everything. I thank you for your patience, and you all have a good day. Thank you. Sid, thank you so much. Up next, we have Rima Iontel from Red Hat. Rima, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Uh, I would like to talk to you today about 5G standalone architecture and how hyper automation relates to it. Uh, service provider networks are notoriously complex and difficult to manage, and for good reason. They're layered, span across large distances, and provide a number of services to very diverse consumers, as we just heard from said. They also have to meet exceptionally high expectations, both from the consumers and from regulators. Service providers have to worry about stringent KPIs around latency, reliability, availability, security, quality of experience, and now also a new one, sustainability. But I want to focus on one specific KPI that is essential to meet all the others, and that is operability. It seems like a simple concept now, but you want to be able to manage your network reliably, its performance, its capacity, and at the same time, maintain its security and integrity. You have to ask yourself, can mere humans accomplish all that when they're dealing with the scale and complexity inherent in any service provider network? Well, the answer is yes, of course they can with the help of automation or better yet, hyper automation. So what do I mean when I say hyper automation? Well, it's a fancy new term for what has been long known as end-to-end -end automation. And that's something that encompasses such concepts as event-driven automation, zero-touch provisioning, and autonomous and self-organizing networks. This is what lies at the heart of the digital transformation for the operators. This is what will, if correctly applied, help them meet their goals in developing new services, bringing in more revenues, cutting down on the operational and even capital expenses while maintaining their carrier grade level of service. Let's look at the end goal of the automation journey and then look at the steps we need to take to reach our destination. What we want is a self-managing network. 
which can holistically adjust at each layer depending on the current conditions and demand. What I mean is the type of services being consumed at the moment and where and by whom they're being consumed. We want a network that can predict consumption patterns and configure itself to meet them just in time. But we also want it to be flexible and aware enough to quickly react to unexpected events. So to achieve that, we need to inject intelligence into the network, teach it how to make decisions, and give it the right tools to affect change. The network needs to be able to do two essential tasks from the operational point of view. It needs to observe itself through comprehensive telemetry collection, and then apply modifications wherever and whenever needed. So before we can achieve the full extent of holistic automation, we have to move through some intermediary steps, especially since automation tools are still maturing, they're still being developed, and also in most cases, we are not dealing with greenfield deployments. So we have to take into account existing network components that were not developed according to cloud native principles and that might not lend themselves that easily to advanced automation. It doesn't mean you cannot automate it. It just means you have to have more effort to do that. I mean, you can just get so far when all you have is a monolithic network function, which supports SNMPs and CLIs instead of microservices based cloud native applications with APIs and declarative self reconciling provisioning. So first we need to move away from manual processes where each network element is its own little island and introduce through every part of the network automation based on GitOps principles of single source of truth for configuration and self-healing with declarative infrastructure as code provisioning model, zero touch provisioning for speed and consistency and AI ops for real-time insights automated monitoring, troubleshooting, and continuous network optimization. Uh, let's bring these all together using, as an example, standalone 5G core deployed on top of a Kubernetes-based platform. Uh, for instance, Red Hat OpenShift. Major difference between standalone 5G core and non-standalone 5G core is the presence of what is already legacy 4G components that might be used for some basic services such as signaling, uh, mobility management, authentication, etc. So what that means is that 5G radio and core networks are not fully independent and rely on the 4G network for some functionality. So many existing 4G networks were built on a combination of traditional network appliances and network function virtualization with say OpenStack or some other virtualization platform acting as a network function virtualization infrastructure and virtual infrastructure manager. OpenStack or other virtualization platforms and VNFs deployed on it, unlike Kubernetes and microservices based CNFs, were not built on cloud native principles. They do not fit easily into GitOps, let alone AI ops frameworks. They don't employ declarative deployment models that ensure consistent configuration across different footprints from on-prem to public cloud and all the way down to the edges. And they don't have effective built-in ability for automatic reconciliation in case of configuration drift or some sort of failure. The also, uh, the mechanisms to automatically scale out services or move workloads at will are not very sophisticated. 
it's not just due to the nature of the platform, but the architecture of the VNFs themselves. Um, such actions would often require either manual intervention, presence of service orchestrator, and proprietary configuration tools, and they might result in planned or even unplanned service outages. Non-standalone 5G core deployments, therefore, require more effort to automate to fit into uh, this hyper-automation model. And they would also require much li larger OPEX investment year over year to overcome the complexity. Standalone 5G core deployed on a hybrid cloud-ready Kubernetes-based platform can use all the multi-cluster where cloud-native tools to move from site design and blueprint creation to automatic initial build-outs of each individual site across the service provider's footprint, and then use the same and additional complementary tools to facilitate lifecycle management and day two operations of the platform and services deployed on it. And that includes automated deployment validation, upgrades, updates, scheduling, rescheduling, and scaling of the workloads, where many of these tasks are achieved through application of continuous control loops, which reconcile between declared desired state versus current one. What's more, the same tools can be used to enable a wider variety of services by enabling easier self-service and such network capabilities as, say, network slicing. And we already heard how important network slicing is to a modern network. I'd like to conclude with emphasizing that hyper-automation is the key to a successful network transformation, which can result in a more efficient, more operable network that can support complex services with improved service levels and reduce downtime. All that without incurring higher operational costs. For that, service providers would have to start now with adapting cloud-native and automation-ready platforms, applications, and tools. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rima. So we'll move straight on now for the panel discussion led by Viet Nguyen. Viet, the floor is all yours. Thank you. And, uh, welcome, everybody. I uh, uh, appreciate your time. And uh, I'm here today. My name is uh, Viet Nguyen, and I'm the director of uh, PR and technology at uh, 5G Americas. Uh, we are a, a trade association represent representing uh, uh, several leading uh, network operators as, uh, and other wireless uh, companies. Um, Fantastic set of, uh, of presentations uh, we saw earlier today. I'm here with some uh, very esteemed guests, uh, and uh, we're going to have a great conversation in regards to uh, 5G standalone architecture and hyper automation. Um, <clears throat> what I'll do is I'll go ahead and uh, 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 do a little uh, intro here of some names, but what I'd love to do for each of my guests is uh, give you an opportunity uh, for about a minute to introduce yourselves, uh, your name, and uh, uh, your organization, uh, and then we'll talk through with a couple of uh, with a few questions and then maybe um, if we have some time left over uh, take uh, three or four questions uh, from the audience there so uh, for those of you in the audience uh, you know get your get your questions ready we'll have uh, we'll have a great conversation today so today with me uh, dr. Venki uh, Ramaswamy from MITRE uh, Luke Eves Hagal Binet and uh, uh, Nandan Ator from uh, Rakuten Symphony so dr. Venki uh, could you introduce yourself and your organization, please? Uh, sure. First of all, thank you so much for the organizers to you know for inviting me for this uh, great uh, event. Uh, my name is Venki Ramaswamy, and I am the chief technologist for NextG at Mitre Labs. And my role here is to uh, be in charge of all R and D activities related to five G and uh, now six G. Um, for those of you not aware of what MITRE is, uh, MITRE is a nonprofit organization uh, working in the public interest. So we are um, 
unbiased advisors to many of the federal agencies. And our work spans um, several areas, including cybersecurity, telecommunications, uh, aviation, uh, public safety, and so on. So uh, we are, you know, nonprofit organization working in the public interest, uh, working uh, on wide variety of topics, including telecommunications. Thank you. Great, thank, thank you, Vicky. Uh, Vicky, and just um, uh, FYI, it look, looks like your uh, uh, sort of the words might be uh, not matching. Uh, uh, the, sort of the audio in the background is uh, a little disrupted there, so we might want to check your virtual background. Um, uh, Luke, uh, can you talk a little bit about yourself and uh, and uh, Pagal Vinet, please? Sure. Uh, my name is Lukif Pagal Vinet. I'm um, running um, the a consulting firm uh, called after my name. Uh, but we have uh, we have um, a serious group of uh, professionals that are supporting um, service providers, um, MNOs, MVNOs, uh, carriers, uh, enterprise as well, uh, and also vendors, to you know to uh, appreciate how we can help them to facilitate their journey for end-to-end -end service orchestration or IP automation, but as well to uh, help them on formalizing uh, the strategies around network slicing, um, private networks, but also multi-domain service assurance. So multi-domain service assurance is actually extremely key and crucial for IP automation and network slicing. So that's what we do. We do consulting and we, we help um, all these players to facilitate or ease the, the, the journey uh, towards these, um, these, um, these elements. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you. And, uh, and Nanda, can you tell us about yourself and, uh, and Rakuten uh, Symphony? Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, lovely opportunity. I'm uh, Srinanda Natur from uh, Rakuten Symphony. Uh, I lead the ambitious vision of uh, telecoms end-to-end uh, -end orchestrator for uh, infrastructure, cloud, and applications uh, with the hyper automation, observability, and security. Uh, all the key terms that you uh, heard from uh, Sid and uh, Rima. Um, so, Hyper automation is the key for managing large networks. Uh, invariably, you will have, as Sid mentioned, different partnerships and multi-vendor. So hyper automation unlocks uh, the ability to automate everything end to end uh, with zero touch provisioning and uh, observability and security to manage everything with a single pane of glass with centralized management. So very happy to be here. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, well thank you for, uh, for that. And, uh... Um, it looks like we've got some uh, great, uh, uh, great folks on this panel. Um, so let me just sort of start out this uh, this conversation a little bit. We uh, heard from our uh, our previous speakers uh, a little bit about uh, uh, 5G networks and the impact of uh, 5G standalone architecture and some of the uh, uh, elements that we talked about. There, obviously, in 5G network in in wireless cellular networks, uh, we have the uh, the radio access network, we have transport networks, and then we have uh, core networks. And uh, and obviously with uh, uh, with five G standalone, it's a little bit different than uh, than what we had previously with uh, with four G LTE networks. Uh, uh, it is uh, entirely five G through uh, with the with the five G core uh, in these in these new networks. So, wondering if uh, we could start a little bit about you know sort of talking about what's the status of five G standalone network deployment globally, um, and and you know in your in your opinion, how are we doing? Uh, how is it progressing? And and uh, uh, how are we close to getting there? Um, anybody want to start uh, off with, uh, with taking that question? I, I can start if, if that's okay. Uh, so yeah. in my opinion, I think the deployment of 5G standalone has been a little bit disappointing. Uh, the reason why I say this is because um, in 2019, when I was at Mobile World Congress, there were a lot of operators uh, that were saying they are going to migrate to standalone in, in a couple of years. Uh, so I was expecting that by now, a lot of operators would uh, actually jump into that uh, bandwagon. But it, that hasn't happened. And if you look at uh, some of the statistics that we have, uh, I would say that the best estimate that we have is the 10 to 15 percentage of the global operators have now moved on to standalone, uh, which is, uh, you know, in my opinion, quite disappointing, uh, given that we have probably around close to, you know, 250 deployments. Uh, worldwide uh, on, on 5G and a very few of them have actually migrated or using um, standalone. Now, 
what what could be the reason for that, right? I mean, there there are, there are probably several reasons, um, but uh, it could be that uh, pandemic has a role to play here because everybody is cutting back on their investments and things like that, uh, and and um, you know that could have cost a reason why they you know they are just scaling back or just waiting to see what will happen because of the high inflation all the supply chain shortages and things like that so that could be one reason but uh, there is also other reasons that i can think of which is basically you know operators might be wanting to um, wait a little bit longer to recoup all their 4g investments right uh, keep in mind that the real reason why you need uh, 5G standalone is not just higher data rate, right? Because if you want, if you just need higher data rate, you can just go with uh, non-standalone. There is no need for that. The need for standalone comes when you want to um, go after these new verticals, these new enterprise verticals, new government verticals uh, that are the areas of maybe you know healthcare, mining. Uh, logistics, manufacturing, and, and those kind of uh, areas where uh, you are targeting more um, low latency applications, uh, high reliability applications, and so on. So it may be that the focus is still on consumers, where the, the idea is to give them better data rate. So, um, you know, it, in my opinion, it's just a matter of time uh, where it, it will it will, you know, the uh, the gen uh, re revenue generation opportunities from these new verticals they will have to operators will have to move on to that uh, that area very soon if not um, you know now so uh, it's it's happening but it's at a slower pace and I would also say that uh, you know uh, Asia Pacific as well as uh, North North America is actually the leaders in actually moving to uh, standalone architecture whereas the you know the 5G deployments itself is happening more rapidly in Europe. Fantastic. Any do any other uh, folks have any thoughts on in terms of the status of uh, deployments for 5G networks or 5G standalone? Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, 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 yes, I can. I can continue uh, what my uh, colleague was saying. Um, I guess yes, it could be said on one side it is a little bit disappointing to to not see enough uh you know operators to move to sa and there are multiple reasons one of which is actually that they want to continue to amortize the the the, the, the major investment that they've done for 4g uh but at the same time yes uh 5g it's it, it's a different bracket from 4g uh, and and Moving from non-standalone to standalone, it's not an easy, an easy uh, path. Um, in the sense where uh, 5G standalone is actually based really on the on the on the 5G core, on the 5G core that is SBA driven, that is cloud native, um, you know, uh, based on cloud native principles. So in that case, you can ask yourself the questions: If I'm not really cloud native on the rest of my domains, should I move right now to to, uh, to an SA transformation. So this is also the, the, the question of how do I address new generation of use case that will be beneficial for, for 4G, uh, you know, for 5G uh, standalone, then this is not something that can be, that can be addressed, um, you know, easily. And um, I would say as well that, you know, on the other side, on further side of this, we have some people that are, you know, we have operators that are moving faster uh, than we we anticipated. Typically, what we see with Safaricom in in Africa, in in Kenya, is a good example of that they have a commercial offering for network slicing already. You can't do that if you don't have, uh, you know, standalone. You also have uh, uh, Telia in Sweden that is also has also released a um, network slicing, uh, you know, offering. We have also KDDI in Japan. So we have multiple examples. Uh, A1, for example, in uh, in uh, in Austria, that is also doing fi uh, you know finalizing a park at the moment for network slicing. So we see that we have some examples of pockets of moves that are interesting, but now you know it, it has to be more generalized in the industry, which is not uh, yet the case. Great. 
Great. And and your thoughts, uh, Nandan, on, on on this? Are are there any are there any other um, points to be made in regards to sort of the status of these uh, these deployments? Yeah, I think I agree with the Venki. So he he spoke about the people mindset training and the uh, the the other thing was about the cost, right? Uh, the network operators have to recoup their capex and capex cost because they have made millions of dollars of investment and they have to somehow recoup that and then be able to move to uh, standalone architectures um with uh, th there are different solutions where um you can modernize your infrastructure and cluster and uh, your your application stack or or your uh, service orchestration stack can still be on the non standalone architecture and over time, when it is the right time for the network operators to make the decision, um, they could move over to the standalone architecture. So there are solutions uh, like that. And maybe we, sh we, we should discuss that more uh, in, in the coming time. Yes, yeah, I think that's actually a great uh, <clears throat> great segue, really sort of thinking, you know, as the as the operators are, are considering sort of their readiness for uh, uh, for standalone uh, uh, architecture, you know, what are, what are some of the benefits uh, that uh, that we might see in um, in these five G standalone networks over over non standalone. I think uh, there were a couple of that uh, things that were already mentioned. Right, one of the things is the uh, the opportunity to do network slicing. Uh, the other opportunity to do um, uh, ultra reliable uh, low latency applications. Um, are there any other sort of thoughts that you might have out there? Like what else might be might be on the on you know might be available there for uh, for these network operators to be looking at. Well, if I can start, you know, I can just say that um, operators, they, they, you know, have to transform themselves internally. It's not necessarily, you know, how do you monetize 5G? Yes, this is, this is, a, this is a crucial question. But nonetheless, you know, uh, 5G is based on cloud native principles. Uh, so on tools, uh, on apps, uh, manageability, observability, and all these elements that will facilitate the way to uh, implement end-to-end -end solution. This is where hyper automation plays a role. Uh, but at the same time, you have to consider as well that uh, you know network slicing is, is one of the elements that could help to monetize 5G. Nonetheless, uh, you know it, it comes with with the view of all the domains uh, of these um, of these uh, given operators will talk to each other in a seamless way. Because as it was mentioned by one of the presenters, you know, if you have a, a, an hybrid composition of your infrastructure, then in that case, this is where you will have more difficulties. If you have, for example, VNF and then CNF and then PNF at the same time, talking to each, trying to talk to each other, this is not perhaps the best way to have an, uh, to have a, an harmonious um, kind of a service infrastructure. So this is where, you know, the difficulty is, you know, finding use cases to find, you know, a new generation of services. It's 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 totally possible. It, this this is not the issue there. The, the issue is really to have a way to, to, to facilitate the communication across the different domains and facilitate not only the communication, leveraging, you know, cloud native, uh, you know, microservices, but also to, 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 to manage them across the board, but also to, to, to observe their behavior when you have a faulty device, when you have service degradation. This is where multi-domain service assurance plays a role as well that is as crucial as, uh, you know, IPO automation. But one thing for fit, you know, to finish on that, um, on that uh, topic, um, 5G is a B2B uh, opportunity. This is not a B2C. So we have to be clear that this is really mainly for enterprise that you will find solution and address verticals. If you don't have that thinking, on the, lurking on the back of your mind, so this is where you might be fooled by the, the interest behind 5G, which is not for, for, for residential. Thank you. Yep, yep, go ahead. Yeah, so um, I've been talking to many of the um, enterprise customers of late, and um, when we when we talk to them, there are actually five aspects that they point out why they want to go towards a standalone architecture, right? And and the first one, as I said before, is because of this ability that standalone architectures where it can provide ultra reliable low latency communications so connectivity which is very um, very mission critical so that's the number one aspect that they always point out the, the next one uh, in my opinion is always the uh, simplicity of architecture because 
uh, remember, uh, these private operators, private operators, they don't have a lot of experience. So they want something that can be managed and uh, orchestrated and, um, it, it, you know, uh, operated in a very simple way. And um, 5G core network architecture actually provides a very simplified architecture, even though uh, it may not look very simplified <laughs> in, in diagrams and things like that. It is actually very uh, simplified when compared to the uh, previous generations. The thir third one is uh, because of all these automation capabilities that we can take advantage of, we can reduce the cost, the cost of operating a network, right? So that's the you know third factor why many of the enterprise users are interested in uh, in going towards um, uh, going towards the uh, you know standalone architecture. The last one. Uh, is uh, something that people may not realize because 5G standalone architecture uh, provides or fixes all the security vulnerabilities that we see in 4G. So that's another feature. So security, you know, people, I don't know uh, how we can quantify this, but people uh, definitely think 5G standalone architecture provides a better security than uh, either NSA or 4G. So that's uh, that's one of the reasons why, you know, at least uh, the verticals that I have talked to, at least the people who are managing those verticals, are interested. Over. Great, great. And and did you have anything to add uh, here, um, Nanda? Yeah. So actually, uh, let's pause and think about the massive impact of uh, URLLC, the ultra reliable low latency communication has and has on the entire humanity, right? Because it is considered that your LLC is actually one of the key drivers of the fourth industrial revolution. Now, if you think about it, the first industrial revolution happened in the 1700s with coal. And then came the second with gas in the 1800s. And then it was the electronics and nuclear in, in, the, in the 1960s. And uh, internet and renewable energy is in the 2000. And what it means is uh, there has been uh, cloud, IoT, 3D printing, genetic engineering etc and your llc is one among them right so what it means is that it will unlock a different um, applications and industry verticals that we have not seen so far and this could be like for example industrial automation where you use robots in manufacturing processes uh, this results in higher yield and returns and where uh, the same goes with car assembly lines and everybody has heard about health healthcare industry the uh, augmented reality assisted surgery uh, intelligent transportation with the drone based delivery and autonomous vehicles so for all of these uh, markets to actually be a success you need low latency communication for uh, like a millisecond latency for communication between the client and the server and it has a massive impact that's fantastic that's fantastic well let's let's, um, um, let's actually dive yeah. in a little bit Just deeper a second. i would like to 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 add something about this segment um you know i uh, I would like just to argue on that, just uh, for the sake of uh, pledging the fact that, um, you know, we need to uh, walk before running. Your LLC is really the, the, the extreme uh, level of, of stringent, um, you know, um, uh, latency and throughput and also digital requirements. It's actually extremely, extremely low. And, and, and there are some low hanging fruits that, that exist before your LLC. We're not ready for your LLC. We have to be clear. Without the transformation of the RAN itself, we're not ready for your LLC. And, and all the, the latest deployments of, of SA and network slicing first deployment of, 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 of the operators that I've mentioned before, they are, they are focusing way more on FWA or EMBB. You can, deliver low latency with with fwn some level but also embb you don't have to go to your llc but your llc is too far down the road in my view and it's too complex at the moment in terms of architecture not only for the 5g core but also for the ran itself you know you need a different level of complexity at the ran with open api open interfaces that are needed in order to achieve your llc and and talking about your llc right now from the start it's actually a little bit way too much in my view for the for the industry to be able to digest such level of complexity that's a that's a very it's a very interesting point um uh, so let me let me actually dig, dig in a little bit deeper on that is there are there sort of any intermediate types of benefits then in terms of specific network functions or processes within an operator's network uh that might help 
to be able to kind of bridge that gap, right? If we if we're already talking right now, you know, uh, that's the consumer side. We were talking about enhanced mobile broadband, but if there is sort of that, you know, that gap to get into the the URLLC applications, are, is there anything sort of in the meantime that uh, is more specific that we can gain from hyper automation in regards to specific network functions and processes? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I can start, but yes, the, the 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 view of the market at the moment is really to have more distributed networks. So distributed networks means that you have edge. Operators at the moment have difficulties to address the edge because they don't have the facilities, neither the the, 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 the infrastructure to support it. So it means that in order to do that, they need to extend the footprint, right? So they have their own realm of multiple domains, RAN, 5G core, transport, and they all and, and they have to manage the end-to-end -end capability uh, of their service infrastructure. This is why cloud native is so important and the disaggregation of the RAN and also the adoption of uh, more cloud native principles on the transport will help to facilitate the end-to-end -end manageability of, of the realm. Now, as soon as you want to touch into the edge, it means that as, as a logical step, you need to extend your operational and business footprint with your partner, typically the hyperscalers. So the edge becomes your extended domain. So you need to extend the hyper automation capability, not to capture what is in your realm, but also to extend it to, um, to the hyperscalers environment, which will uh, bridge naturally towards hybrid edge. So the edge cloud will become also part of your own service infrastructure. So this is where you can, you can in that case, exploit some um, interesting B2B uh, services. For example, cloud gaming, CDNs. Uh, you can also imagine some mission critical application that could be located closer to, to, the, uh, to, uh, to the end user. But once again, we have to think about edge. If you move application closer to the end user, what does it mean? Does it solve everything for the latency? No, because moving the application closer only produce a 30% improvement in terms of, you know, um, quality of experience, latency, jitter. And the rest comes with acceleration of the RAN, acceleration uh, uh, and adoption of new set of APIs that will accelerate the treatment of the data. This is why I, I believe that before we reach uh, URLC, there are multiple uh, steps that we need to achieve. For example, FWA is, 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 the, is, a natural, is a natural first step. After this could be EMBB. And when we say EMBB, we could be closer to near real time. So near real time will be 10 milliseconds to 500 milliseconds. And in real time, like URLC will be closer to real time. It will be 10 milliseconds and below. So this is why, you know, before reaching URLC, we have some intermediate steps that could be interesting to 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 tap into. Fantastic. So, uh, go, go ahead. Uh, I actually, I have a comment uh, on that. Uh, uh, so are you trying to say that um, URLC is not ready, that we all know, but um, instead of going into life critical applications, it is better to test the waters with uh, entertainment, Im immersive media, gaming, which is uh, maybe of the order of 10 to 500 milliseconds, test out the network. And once that is successful, go a little uh, faster with even more uh, low latency and then try out the life critical applications. Was that your point? Mostly, yes, because you also have to assume something. 5G, 5G, 5G is only possible. 5G is only possible if you have a, a, a fiber infrastructure to support you. Uh, and um, Without that fiber infrastructure, you can't you can't actually deliver all the benefit that is that is ex, that is expected out of 5G. So the the countries that have really deep fiber penetration, like Europe or, or, or Eastern uh, or Eastern Asia, have the capabilities to support that. So in such a case, if you want to tap into URLC, you need to have both the the the, the fiber infrastructure, but you also need to have the the capability to to support the end-to-end -end manageability that we were talking about with with the with cloud native so before reaching urlc you need to have a certain level of ingredients in order to help you to to reach utmost uh you know complexity 
And ULC, as you know, it's way more complex on the 5G because it will put some pressure on, on notably responsiveness, also the duplication of, of, of network functions in order to support URLC. URLC on, on its construct is different from EMBB or FWA, fundamentally different actually. Fantastic. And, and I think that we, uh, we had some, uh, Dr. Becky, you, you were gonna say something? Yeah, so I'll quickly add that uh, the short-term application of uh, automation, uh, in my opinion, it's mainly in the OSS segment, right? Uh, things like fault management, um, automatic service provisioning, configuration management, uh, planning, and so on. And um, even though we, we do this today, but by taking advantage of automation and advanced uh, learning techniques, this can be done at a much faster scale. Now, think about how we do slicing today, right? So we, we can do slices, but um, you know the real advantage of slicing would come when you are able to actually adapt to network conditions, right? Can we grow the slice? Can we shrink the slice? Can we make sure that the resource needed for a slice are adapted? based on the network conditions. So it's a it's a continuous closed loop management that we can uh, employ using these uh, slicing, uh, using these automation techniques that would be very beneficial. Uh, that's one thing. The second thing is what uh, Luke was talking about, edge uh, deployments, right? So keep in mind that edge, the resources at the edge are also very constrained. Uh, that's why they are at the edge. Um, and um, the role of automation is to make sure that we, um, we use those resources in a very prudent way, uh, meaning that if the, if the edge application requires some sort of a compute and storage and things like that, uh, it provides exactly what is needed for that given application at that point in time, right? So those, those are the, I think, applications which may not be as sexy as uh, the other uh, uh, URL C applications that we are talking about, but still has a lot of um, impact, in my opinion. Uh, about you know, optimizing the network and configurations and things like that. So uh, it's really the the additional aspects that you get from automation that are going to be a game changer in my opinion. Yeah, that's, that's some excellent points, and uh, specifically in that that OSS sort of standpoint. Are, uh, are are there any other sort of impactful use cases that we might be looking at in terms of uh, of automation, or um, you know, if if not, I mean, there's certainly um, uh, offers, you know, hyper automation certainly offers uh, uh, opportunities uh, if we are to get the operators to uh, adopt these sort of cloud native principles, right? I mean, we haven't even touched on, on DevOps, you know, uh, in terms of uh, improving network uh, efficiency and, and, and innovation. Uh, does anybody have any thoughts in terms of, you know, this this collision of, of IT and, um, and and telco and how uh, how Autom hyper automation is really going to uh, uh, benefit the, the telcos from, from that standpoint. Um, that, that's a that's a difficult question, actually. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very simple one, but yeah. I would say that the, the 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 difficulty is that hyper automation brings something also new. The the concept of leveraging you know, human-less intervention. So what you want to bring at some point is to have less intervention, to have more AIML model that can support you, help you make decisions. Sometimes the decisions and not to reach the, the, the Skynet uh, kind of limit, but uh, you all, always have some control, but nonetheless, the, you have supported by AIML. You have a universal uh, inventory to capture everything that is uh, making your service infrastructure. And actually, what you want to do have is um, uh, CI/CD and and CT pipeline. So now the, there's there's an evolution where the T, the testing, is actually getting more actually more important than the rest, because if you think about CNFs or microservices, they tend to be you know functions that are evolving separately from the rest of the pack, right? So if you take, for example, the VCU from Open RAN, you can imagine that the VCU will, will, will evolve differently than, than the UPF because it's not the same context, not the same role, not the same importance. So actually, this is where DevOps will play a role to uh, capture the need for a given, 
let's say network functions or or, or CNF, and make make some evolvements that are you know capturing the need uh, from your customer base. And exactly as Venki mentioned, the goal is to look at how I will differentiate myself in the industry, but at the same time manage it as a whole. Because if you take the UPF or the uh, or the VCU function, they still reside in the, in the service infrastructure that is uh, ultimately integrated and connected. So this is where the the, the, the CI, CD, and CT uh, capabilities will will become extremely important going forward. Excellent, Becky. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I, I could just uh, add a little bit to what Luke was saying. Uh, to me, by adopting that uh, CI/CD pipeline, CI/CD architectures, and things like that, or operations, uh, things like that, it's ba it's basically buying me um, a shorter time to market, right? So I can uh, launch and deliver my applications swiftly. Uh, people call this a zero weight uh, in many contexts, but it's basically, you know, I can I can do things in a more agile fashion with zero wait time, right? I mean, as soon as I'm ready, I can just launch my applications. Um, I can, um, you know, use this to uh, dramatically improve my uh, customer experience or customer um, uh, experiences. So it's it's really, uh, you know, getting us to the global web scale uh, reach as well as improving the customer experience uh, by adopting this, you know, agile operations as well as, uh, you know, zero weight um, launching and delivery of services. Great, great. Now, then, did you have anything to add to that, to that as well? Yeah, so a small point to that. Uh, I think uh, with, with the CICD, um, it plays a very important role uh, with, with the 5G because um, it, it's not just about the initial uh, day zero provisioning um, and uh, lifecycle management. It's because you have different layers, right? You have infrastructure, you have clusters, and you have applications. And now, uh, let's say, uh, maybe on day N, you will have upgrades. So continuously, your infrastructure is evolving because you have BIOS upgrades, firmware upgrades, operating system upgrades, etc. Now, your cluster, uh, most probably, it is running cloud-native functions, which is based on containers and microservices and Kubernetes. So the Kubernetes itself has to upgrade. And then you have your applications, which are continuously evolving. So you have upgrades happening at all the three different layers, infrastructure, cluster, and applications. And now these are coming in a different cadence, right? It could be a week, it could be months and six months to a year. And so you should have a continuous flow of these uh, upgrades. Uh, f f and that has to go through a pipeline. Usually it goes through uh, sandbox staging. And then once it is vetted with continuous testing and et cetera, it goes to production. So uh, the pipeline, the CACD pipelines play a very important role uh, to make sure that the processes are followed and there is continuous flow um, so that the things are upgraded in a timely ma manner. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, uh, I actually want to leave uh, this um, one question before we get to the Q&A here, uh, which is, uh, as, as you're all alluding to, uh, you know, the role of, of AI and ML as it, as it, uh, as it plays in, in, in hyper automation and maybe talk to me a little bit about um, how, you know, what are some of the um, uh, impacts of AI and, and ML, maybe also specifically as it relates to sort of visibility across the, the network and, you know, how, how do we utilize that to, to, to sort of um, help deal with some of this complexity that we're going to be dealing with? There's a lot, you know, a lot of different upgrades, different cadences, the complexity is, is going to be very um, staggering. Um, anybody want to tackle that uh, that issue yeah go, go ahead uh, um uh, uh thank you yeah sure so as i said right um you know the real real motivation for this is zero weight uh, zero touch and zero outage right so we want network to be completely automatic and and um you know people probably don't realize it the networks are becoming extremely complex uh, complex because we are adding more and more services uh, we are adding more and more technologies because uh, you know, 5G and 6G will let non-3GPP technologies to be connected to uh, 3GPP technology, right? For Wi-Fi, for example, 
all right so you, you have these networks of networks that are that that you are uh, that you are trying to operate and they are completely geographically distributed right so you have edge uh, nodes that are far off from your centralized node so you have a very very complex network uh, that needs reaction times much much more uh, shorter than we have experienced before only way we can do this uh, only way we can uh, tackle this complexity is let um, uh, let machines take care of it rather than us because it has to go through all these different uh, sample paths of configurations and things like that so th so uh, the 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 role of machine learning and um, things like you know reinforcement learning right where it's it's exploring these different configurations that is best suited for a given uh, scenario right you know ma machine learning has done things like you know finding out uh, the drug drug discovery so it's it's going through all these complex configurations and finding out what is the best configuration for a given scenario so that's can only be done by machine learning ai and ml now we have to also keep in mind that uh, there is uh, there is an enorm enormous amount of data that needs to be uh, crunched which has uh, implications with respect to sustainability our energy efficiency and so on so it's not a solution that is cheap i would say because um, you know there are studies which say that uh, the accuracy of machine learning. I mean, you can get from 90 to 95 to get to that level. The amount of data that you need uh, to to go from 90 to 95 could be enormous, right? So it's a it's always a compromise of how accurate how accurate you want your predictions to be. Uh, what kind of resources you want to use to get to that prediction and things like that. So it's a, it's not an easy solution, and it's not, it's not as you know, uh, it's a, not a solution that will solve all your problems. But it is something that we must take uh, advantage of and maybe much explore. Great, uh, Luke. I think you wanted to say something as well. Yes, I guess um, AI ML can 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 be exploited in in two different ways. Uh, the first way is actually on 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 automation. You have a hyper automation. Hyper automation is kind of an umbrella of capability that is encompassing all the domains, right? So RAN, transport, five G core, and naturally, if you want to make proactive decisions or or quick reactive decisions. Can the this umbrella, this end-to-end -end umbrella, can 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 be used to do that? No, it's not possible. So what you need to do is to delegate some orchestration capabilities to lower layer functions. So this is why. So this is why you you hear in there, you hear about edge orchestration capabilities. This is why you, you you we talk about the SMO. For example, the SMO is a good example of that. What is the SMO? The SMO is an orchestration capability for RAM. So the same exists for, for transport with network automation layer. The same exists for 5G with the, with the 5G orchestration capability. And for the edge, Mac and PNF, you will have the same. You will have an edge orchestration uh, um, function. The goal of that will be in that case to have the AI ML to be closer to the action, to collect the data and make decision on the faster on a faster rhythm. In such a case, you will have you will feedback the the data intelligence to to the to the to the low to uh, to the uh, to the lower layer decision makers in order to leverage closed loop automation, and closed loop to, closed loop automation will have you know several loops. You'll have a loop that will be closer to the action, and there will be a larger loop that will be closer to the to the to the hyper automation layer. This is this is one way to use AI ML. Now for for multi-domain service um, service assurance, assurance now becomes extremely important because you need to collect the data from all the domains to understand what's happening at the granular at the granular level because you need also to to tap into the hardware layer to understand if one card the memory the CPU is faulty or not. Then service degradation will be detected quickly. Will be then communicate it back to to the loops, either to the lower uh, lower layer functions or to the higher layer function, to make a decision. This is what will be happening, for example, for network slicing. When you have the NSMF, the NSSMF, and you will make decision based on this information. So AI ML can be used in that particular order, but at the same time, now you can ask yourself, that's interesting. But what do you do for edge? 
the edge will be in the same way. You will have capability that will be supporting the edge, the distributed networks in order to leverage AI, ML, data collection, remediation across the domains. Because at the same time, if you have an end-to-end -end slice, the slice will will be impacted by a, a service degradation at the at the RAM. So this is where AI, ML can be used. Could be could be fueling data and information to to the automation layer to make uh, proactive or or, or or predictive decisions. Wait, great, great answer. Uh, and not done. Do you have, you have anything to add before we maybe go to some questions from the uh, audience here? Yeah, so I would like to take one point that Sid mentioned about the deep visibility uh, and observability, right? And how AI ML can help. So with uh, I like to take an example. So let's say you have a network slice. And network slice is composed of different network functions. Uh, obviously, they're running on different geo-distributed clusters. The clusters is a combination of different nodes. And the applications are consuming uh, resources. It could be compute and storage. And it could be uh, certain isolated cores. And these cores are oscillating at different frequencies and consuming different amounts of energy. Now, if you try to get, so this is the deep visibility. You're going uh, top down. And if you collect the metrics from the different layers, um, from infrastructure cluster, uh, applications, uh, network functions, and slice, uh, this easily close to about 100,000 uh, metrics that are always changing the different KPIs. Now, if you want to um, do service assurance on top of this for a particular network slice, well, you're, uh, if you go with a traditional approach of uh, certain uh, rules, it would be very, very tedious because you're dealing with hundreds of thousands of metrics and KPIs. Now, uh, AIML could play a very pivotal role in making sure that you know all of those things, the KPIs, the different knobs, uh, it could play, it could be easier with the AIML. Absolutely, yes, we're uh, increasingly uh, very, very complex uh, networks as we as we go forward here. So uh, we appreciate the the different viewpoints that uh, each of you bring to the table. Uh, at this point, I'd love to be able to take some questions from the audience. I know we've got one already that's uh, uh, that's come in here, and uh, uh, I'll go ahead and read it out here. Um, uh, do you find participation in standard setting organizations such as the ORAN Alliance uh, crucial or challenging on developing and deploying architecture? And uh, does it have you know, quite an impact on uh, uh, on stuff? So really focused around sort of standards organizations. And I think, uh, uh, Dr. Venki, would you maybe address that? I, I know you've got some expertise in that area. Yeah, sure. So uh, let's look at a 5G network, right? So 5G network has three components, the RAN segment, uh, transport segment and the core segment. Uh, and the services that we are talking about is end to it. And uh, when we talk about the stand standalone core and things like that, it's mainly the core segment that we are talking about. And we can be more sophisticated, we can be cloud native in that segment. But if the RAN segment uh, is not as sophisticated and not as agile as the core segment, you're not going to get the full benefit, right? So, uh, for example, uh, it, it's not going to give you a, a full benefit of slicing if you only do slicing in the core segment. It has to be an end-to-end -end slicing, right? So, uh, and and the uh, adoption of cloud-based technologies in RAN has always lagged behind others other steps, right? So that's that's going to be an important aspect, and that's where I believe uh, organizations like ORAN would uh, would uh, would would have an impact, and where they they could they would come into picture where we are we are we are bringing the cloud native principles we are bringing the open architecture to the ran as well which has been a laggard in, in that area and um, by doing so we are actually making you know, the the maturity of all these segments equal so that you can have a full end to end service that is uh, that is going to provide the benefits of uh, you know this end to end aspects of slicing and so on so that's um, that's my key point there that i think um, the participation in oran alliance and things like that it's going to be uh, crucial and it's going to have a lot of impact because in the end it's an end to end system that we are talking about and if if you have bottlenecks that are not as good as the other segments we are not going to get the full benefits over great good. Did anyone else want to want to address any parts of that question? Go ahead. Uh, yes, I could add um, uh, very interesting what Venki said, and I would add uh, to that that um, well, um, 
um, service, you know, standard organization are trying to push different kind of uh, views about the, the evolution of service infrastructure. Uh, 3GPP is one, you have the MEF, you have TIP, they're all contributing in different ways. Uh, but at the same time, for example, if you look at Oran Alliance and the, the Oran evolution, we can see already that the, the view of multi-vendor within one domain is, uh, is extremely complex to, to achieve. So the momentum at the moment, it looks like it will be much more a VRAN approach with a single vendor rather than a multi-vendor kind of best of breed approach. So, but what is interesting is when standards are communicating with each other, working together to formalize a unified view and reach a consensus, exactly what CNCF has done for cloud native, right? So mm -hmm. it was a good example. Now, if you look at the transport, that's a very different question because, for example, IETF, is, it's kind of an isolated island. Yes, they have right. some liaison with MEF and other standards, but they're kind of doing their own things, uh, you know, nonetheless. So this is where, you know, the difficulties of dealing with standards and multiple of standards, for example, Camara, uh, MEF, uh, TMF, uh, TIP, and, and, and all, uh, uh, all, of, all of that, it's actually a spaghetti that is extremely complex to, to achieve for, for an operator. And, like, uh, and I'm sure that our colleague from Rakuten could, could tell, uh, could tell uh, great stories about this. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Before we go, do, do you have anything uh, from, uh, from Rakuten's standpoint uh, uh, in regards to uh, your work with, uh, with standards? Well, I, I think I, I guess I completely agree with Luke and uh, Venki. Yeah. yeah, fantastic. Well, thank you, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, thank you for the, and also thank you to the members of the audience. Uh, uh, this is a fantastic conversation. I actually learned quite a lot, uh, uh, and and your viewpoints uh, helped to crystallize uh, uh, several of the uh, ideas that I, I, I was having as well. You know, as a um, uh, market res representation partner for Three GPP ourselves, Five G Americas uh, very much appreciates uh, uh, your viewpoints here. Uh, anyways, thank you for your time, and uh, I would like to uh, bring it back to you, uh, the folks at, uh, at Pure Store Wireless for the rest of the event. Thank you, everyone. That was a very interesting discussion to wrap up this year's show. And of course, let me finish the session by thanking Rakuten Symphony and Red Hat for their support, in addition to mm -hmm. all other sponsors and speakers for the show. Make sure you complete the post-event survey to let us know how you found this year's event, as we do appreciate your feedback. Make sure you join us on April the 18th and the 19th, where we'll have our next event, Broadband Technology Summit, for which you can find more information on our website. My name is Oliver Ward, your host, and on behalf of Fierce Wireless, thank you for attending, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. 